this. I'm Devin. I'm Dan. And today, are you in a library, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> yes, my beautiful backdrop library. <laughs> <laughs> well, Courtesy you... of you as a Christmas gift. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you're very smart. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Look at all your books. <laughs> I've read them all, cover to cover. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. Uh, but uh, today, you're going to tell me about something. It's going to be a special episode. Yeah. Are we doing what, what things we like, or are we saving that for a more uh, traditional tome Yeah, I was just figuring format. we'd save that. This, this is one of our single reporter style episodes, <laughs> but it's me okay. this time. Yeah, tell me, tell me about uh, the YouTube drama. No, this time we're going to talk about something a little cooler. <laughs> um, I was thinking we talk about the Mad Max series, and one of the reasons was I was inspired um, to read the book Blood, Sweat, and Chrome, The Wild and True Story of Mad Max Fury Road by Kyle Buchanan. And it was really good, and it just kind of made me want to revisit the Mad Max franchise, and, you know, because some of them I haven't seen since I was younger and stuff like that. And, you know, just to kind of compare and see. And, you know, over time and since we've been doing this show, of course, you know, I've looked into more film techniques and editing and et cetera. Like, again, I'm no film guru genius, but got a little eye there. <laughs> and so, I mean, you're it, in a library full of books about film technique. <laughs> true. And so that was kind of why I wanted to do this. And I guess I wanted to start by asking... I know you've seen Fury Road, but have you seen any of the other Mad Max films? Like, what's your kind of relation with the franchise? So, I am one of the only people in the history of existence who didn't really care for Fury Road. <laughs> um, but aside from that, I feel like I have seen one of the Mel Gibbs, like, either the first one or the second one. Mm. Uh but it was a long time ago at 4 a.m. kind of situation. Sure. And I don't really remember any. The first one's really like, like the second one's where it gets wacko, right? Like where it gets kind of bizarre. Sure. I mean, they're all kind of bizarre in their own way. <laughs> but I mean, the first one's a little bit more mundane compared to the rest of them. Yes, which is what I wanted to talk about. One of the things, yeah. Like he's just a dude in a post-apocalypse running around kind of thing? Well, that, that's all of them, but yes. <laughs> no, but, like, the lore isn't developed. There's not as many... Like, there's gangs, yeah. but they're not, like, as prominent. Yeah, again, that was something I wanted to discuss, talking about the first one, especially. Okay, I think I've seen the first one. Okay. Yeah, because it's very interesting, of course, that they're all made by George Miller. He directed all four of them. Um, but he's had multiple writers that helped help them write them uh, over the years. But his career is also kind of interesting. Like before he made Mad Max 1, he did a couple, um, you know, short films and smaller things, of course, like that. He does Mad Max and it hits pretty good that he gets interest from America, makes the Road Warrior, which is the second Mad Max. Right. And yeah. From, and then from there, he kind of just continues like he does a Twilight Zone um, in an 83 movie. He does the Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, the, the thing on the wing. Uh, part. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, so cool. that was him. That was him. Yeah, and then he moves on from that, does the Witches of Eastwick. No way. Yeah. <laughs> then that Lorenzo. Movie's really weird. <laughs> yeah, does Lorenzo's Oil. Don't know Pro that one. Yeah, uh, it's pretty famous as far as I know. Produces the first Babe movie, then directs the second one because he was okay. just like, yeah, I'll step in and direct it. Then does the two Happy Feet movies. Which, of course, he won an Oscar for Happy Feet 1. <laughs> I didn't know there was two Happy Feet movies. Yeah, he did them both. And then he does Fury Road. And then the last credit in 2022 was 3,000 Years of Longing, which is like a, a genie movie. Yeah, yeah, with Tilda yeah. Swinton and... Um, Idris Elba, right? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It looks really weird and interesting. Yeah, which is kind of this guy's MO, of course. <laughs> what an interesting, like, breadth of... Movie style cities stuff. But they're all weird. Yeah, and they're all kind of unique in a way. And he's it's also like the most interesting, of course, is when he comes back to Fury Road, is that like he's an older director. Like he's like 
90 now <laughs> or something, oh, wow. right? Yeah, like he's an older gentleman and he's been, you know, doing this for a long time. And so it was just like usually, a, a, you know, an action movie, you think a younger man's game, you know, like especially some of the second year directors like get in there and mix it up and stuff like that. And but here he was making this movie. He had the vision. And it's something, well, like I said, I would like to talk a bit about when we get to Fury Road. But yeah, like I said, it was just I even I didn't realize some of the movies he's worked on <laughs> that it was just kind of like. Interesting. Yeah, I'm just going to pause one second, because if I don't say this, I'll mm-hmm. be upset with myself. But mm-hmm. The Witches of Eastwick has some of the best 80s hair you've <laughs> ever seen. It's Cher, Susan Sarandon, and Michelle Pfeiffer, and they all just have the biggest 80s hair <laughs> ever, and it's it's so good. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it, uh, is Jack Nicholson also in that? Yeah, he plays the devil, but, right. like, it's one of those movies where, like, I think it was supposed to be kind of, like, n- like a little bit of, like, male wish fulfillment because all three women end up falling for him. Sure. But it it's really just, I think it's, like, like it's hard to watch it and, and it's a woman and not feel gay about it. Because <laughs> the women in it are so beautiful, <laughs> and they're like friends, and they help each other out. And then you're like, I just want to marry. I I want to be Jack Nicholson in that movie. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting as well, like because along with that, like he he produces like a ton of movies. His producer credits are all myriad and all over the place. And but his wife also produces his movies. Oh, cool. And so they were worked together for a long time as well. So maybe like you're saying, there's a bit of a a female eye in his projects and yeah I, I i think i just assumed the witches of eastwick was like written or or directed by a woman i think when i watched it but yeah because like three quarters of the movie is like is like wish fulfillment for dude <laughs> and one quarter of the movie is like fe- feminine rage at its absolute best <laughs> I've never seen it, uh, so I, I uh, fair not, it's out of my wheelhouse. Sorry. <laughs> it's really good if you like big hair. Yeah, <laughs> see it for the fashion. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the fashion in it is great too, because it's like that. It's '80s fashion, which I just I love it. <laughs> Impractical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah, like I said, we'll start with Mad Max, the first one, 1979. Done by him, uh, James McCausland, George Miller, and Byron Kennedy wrote it. I kind of like, so he did it on a $300,000 budget, which uh, I calculated it to now dollars. It's $1.2 million, brought in $37 million. So pretty good return. And that that's why, like I said, he kind of got some more attention. And as you said, it stars Mel Gibson in the titular role of Max. Mm-hmm. And... Um, like a few of his regulars kind of show up here and there, like uh, Hugh Case Byrne, he plays the toe cutter, which is the main bad guy in it, like the leader of the, the gang. His partner, I believe, is uh, Jim Goose, played by Steve Bisley. Uh, Tim Burns plays this guy called Johnny Boy, or Johnny the Boy, which is kind of like a trying to become part of the gang, right? So they're like, oh. go do the things, Johnny, or then, you know, he's screwing things up and everything like that. But it was funny because I don't think I've ever seen this movie. And so I watched it, and it it's a movie from the 70s. Like you said, literally nothing happens. And I was like, okay, like I know he, he's got a wife, he's got a kid and everything. And I was like, standard revenge situation. He, uh, in the beginning, you know, great practical cars because they have to smash everything themselves. <laughs> There's no CG yeah. here at this point. Uh, they capture a guy, or he, like, doesn't want to get captured, so he, like, suicide by cop style. And so the gang's like, we're going to get revenge. And you're like, okay, they're going to get revenge on Mel Gibson for what he did and his partner. That doesn't happen for like 20 minutes. Eventually his partner kind of gets burned up and, he, and you're like, okay, it's time for revenge. No, Mel Gibson leaves the force because he's like, I don't want to die as well. It's a weird post-apocalypse, kind of. <laughs> and, and then him and his wife and their child, they go driving in the countryside they encounter some things again nothing is happening and i'm like where is the revenge there's a great scene that they, they go and i guess they're at his mom's or his wife's mom's place 
and he's off, you know, doing some fishing or something like that kind of thing. And she is kind of getting like chased in the woods, but it's shot in such a way where you never see anybody who's chasing her. Like just like, you know, the quick Ooh. glance behind like a tree branch and stuff like that. Like really good tension. And I'm like, okay, finally, here's the scene. No, she eventually yep. gets in a car, is driving away. And I'm just like, when is this revenge supposed to happen? <laughs> never. <laughs> are. And this is finally, you know, they catch up with her, kill her and the child. Or at least her, his kid is dead, but she is heavily wounded. She's like in the hospital, you know, in like a coma type situation. Then it's time for revenge, finally. But then there's only like 20 minutes left in the movie. <laughs> and so it all happens like really quick. And it was just kind of surprising to me, like you said, where it's very meandering. And uh, I guess just from a modern perspective where you're like, yeah, you set it up. They want revenge. You know, wife or somebody gets killed and then he goes for revenge and that's 45 minutes of movie. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> it's the other way around. <laughs> but one yeah, thing I, re I remember it being boring. Yeah, I was I was more bored than I was expecting, but the car and driving stunt work was incredible because they were doing it all real, <laughs> right? They're smashing stuff, driving around. I was like, okay, this is like this is some good stuff here. But it was, yeah, very meandering. The gang is like harassing some random locals and nothing happens. <laughs> I was just kind of like, okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, eventually he catches up with the tow cutter, gets his revenge on all of them. Uh, like I said, the, the final climactic kind of car chase with the convoy, that was really cool. And the Johnny, the boy kind of gets away and he eventually tracks him down. And this may be either a nod or where Lee Winnell, because Lee Winnell is Australian. He's the guy who did the first saw. Mel Gibson leaves the guy in a scenario. He chains his ankle to a metal pipe and there's gas near a flame. And he's like, here's a saw. It's, you can cut through the chain in maybe 10 minutes, but that gas will get there quicker than that. And he just leaves. And then there's an explosion. And I was like, he just saw this guy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. So I was kind of like, again, like I said, Lee Winnell is Australian. So it very well is either an homage or a nod to it. Mm. Um, but uh, that just kind of surprised me. <laughs> and then, yeah, like I said, the movie just kind of ends. And uh, it's so in the first one, like you said, the lore isn't really as much there because it's more just like it's not full post-apocalypse. It's just kind of like they're not really cops. They're almost like vigilantes. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Kind of a law because they arrest sort of arrest the guy, but he gets off on like technicalities where they're like, there was no evidence and blah, blah, blah. And there was like some lawyer types. And like his partner punches one of them. And so I was like, yeah, like you said, it wasn't like full on, you know, compared to the third movie where they're like, it is a full apocalypse. Because in the second one, it's not really stated as much. Um, the second one, they're, it's just all costuming done by like fetish uh, clothing <laughs> stores, right? <laughs> a little bit. Um, yeah, we can bounce to the second one. And I was kind of surprised because many times when... Not many times, but sometimes when an indie director does like their first one and it kind of does well, um, the second one when they get all the money might just be almost like a straight retread, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah, yeah, now yeah. it's like now I can put all my ideas I had into this. They don't. He doesn't do that again. Mel Gibson returns as Max, and then yeah, bigger cast, bigger budget. Um, Three million back in '81, about ten million today, and it brought in the equivalent of about eighty million from the box office there. So. Good for Eight them. time, you know, moderate hit. And uh, this one was written with Terry Hayes, George Miller, and Brian Hannett. And yeah, this one, like you said, kind of starts with an opening monologue about some lower building. And this kind of continues on. And it's it's kind of cool because it creates Max as like, you know, the folk hero type where it's like, mm -hmm. we met a man named Max. But in this one, again, he's he's just out there driving. He's, he's just driving <laughs> around trying to get gas, <laughs> right? And I was, again, kind of surprised where, because this one has, like, the feral kid situation and everything like that. Um, and uh, what's his name here? He comes back. Uh, Bruce Spence, I believe it is. Yeah, he's the gyro captain. He comes back as a regular as well. And, um, like, he's just driving around, and then the entire movie takes place around this uh, gas town it's called it's just literally like a small refinery protected by a wall and like you said mm -hmm. everybody's there 
in there. They had, they're all wearing like white and like hockey and like football pads and stuff like that, right? And all the bad guys, like you said, are mostly in like leathers and masks and all that kind of stuff like all that. All the right? bad guys robbed a sex shop before they came down. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And it's it's kind of interesting in that Max's whole plan, he's just like, I just want to get in there and get some gas. I don't care about like the situation. He's like, yeah, they could all die. I don't know. <laughs> and and <laughs> So he just kind of waits and then like captures or not tries to rescue like one of the people that gets like sent out on a scouting mission and he brings him back and he's like, hey, your dude died. Uh, here he is. We can make some kind of deal. I just want some gas. And he basically he's like, I'll go out, recover a tanker, which is seen in the beginning of the movie. I'll bring that back so you guys can take your gas and drive wherever and you give me gas and I'll drive wherever, you know, that's the deal. And they're like, Sure, because they got nobody who's, like, skilled like Max, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then so he just goes out, gets the tanker, comes back, and, you know, completes the deal. They give him the gas, even though they're like, hey, you should stay with us because we're going to go somewhere better than where we are. You know, there's, like, a supposed better place out there somewhere. And he's like, no, nah, I've been <laughs> driving around forever. I'm, I'm Mad Max. It's just desert. <laughs> but they're like, no, there is the place. Um, but he's like, no, I'm out drives out he gets attacked by the gang you know they mess him up and etc and so he goes back to the people and he's like okay i'll drive your tanker it'll get me out there and i can get revenge essentially on the gang and then yeah the final action sequence this one is is better in its construction of like action scenes and stuff like that where there's it's not in the last like in the last final action scene is spectacular and stuff like that, but there's more throughout the movie where you're not just like Okay, is anything happening? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it is more comical in that the story is very thin in that, like, like in the first one, it's like I said, he's, you know, there's a revenge angle and this and that. And this is just like, he's just like, I'm just waiting to get into this town. And you're <laughs> like, that what, that's the plan here? <laughs> so it would, it, it would like not be an inaccurate description of the movie to be like this is a movie about a guy who needs to fill up his tank yeah it's literally that's the movie. <laughs> perfect yeah. it's just like i just need some gas and then yeah they do a good final action sequence which you can tell like some of these inspirations are brought into fury road because he's driving a big tanker truck which of course oh, yeah, yeah, they yeah. Fury Road, and yeah it's getting attacked by all sorts of angles and people and cars and you know he's fighting them off and he gets help from the feral kid and you know, there's grenades and all sorts of stuff like that. But then there's the cool twist at the end where he never had the gas. It was hidden in another vehicle. <laughs> no. Yeah. So they were so the they were kind of using him essentially. Um. And uh, he just kind of gets left there. And then there's like an ending uh, narration as well where they're like, we never saw Max again. And I'm now the leader of the, co uh, the people. It's the feral kid who's doing the narration. And he's just like, Max helped us out that day, and then it's over. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, yeah, like you said, it helps build that lore about what's going on. They In the beginning, they like I said, that narration, again, talks a bit about, like, oil wars and water wars and this or that, but there's no explicit, like, nukes went off or anything like that. It's more just, like, mm -hmm. again, it's crap. But in the third one, that's when the they bring The third one's got stuff. Tina Turner in it. That there is. <laughs> I haven't seen this one either. You haven't seen Beyond Thunderdome? Yeah, oh, that's why I was going to call it Escape from Thunderdome, but Beyond Thunderdome is the correct name. Yes. <laughs> it is indeed Beyond Thunderdome, 1985. So you got some I, 80s fashion. Yeah. <laughs> People didn't like this one, right? No, it didn't do as well. Like, I mean, like, it's interesting because, again, so this one had a budget about $10 million and it brought in $36 million worldwide. Uh, right. In our equivalent, yeah, about twenty-eight million dollars and one hundred and three million are in our dollars. Mm. Uh, so profitable for sure. Like yeah. all the fans went and saw, but I think, like you said, it just doesn't have that multiplier. Maybe people didn't go see it multiple times. Not as right. successful. Like because I know that the Road Warrior as well, like the second one, was played on like cable and HBO. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I don't think that the first or the third one are played as much. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't the third one, I'm just remembering from what people have told me, but don't they try to introduce some children into it as well? We're going to get to it, yes. <laughs> Which is never a good idea. Yeah, like the feral kid in the second one pushes the line, but there's only yeah. one. 
There's only one yeah, kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't talk either. He just kind of grunts a bunch. <laughs> right. This is a good way to minimize child annoyingness. Yeah. There's exactly. some good ch like child actors. I can't of think course. of any off the top of my head, but there's some when you watch them, they're like, "Oh my god, this guy's great," or whatever. Yeah. But like, the majority of them, especially in this time period, just come across as super irritating. Yes. <laughs> just they're just the worst. <laughs> well, and even like. You know, the craft of acting has come a long way as well, where even some of the oh, actors yeah. from the past, like, you know, they're like, you know, there's, there are those classic actors that stood out because they were good at it, you know, more naturally and stuff like that. But yeah, like supporting care, like other actors around them, you're like, oh my God, all these people are terrible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just yeah. progression. <laughs> yeah. Like film in general is at a higher level now than it was in the, you know, in previous yeah. years. Of course. But so are like sports stars. Like, yeah. People set records so that the next generation can break them, right? Like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And like you, like you said, there, it's the same like in music as well. Like, everyone's like, oh, that music in the past, like, was, was so great, or like rock music specifically. And it's like, no, that's just because, like, from now, from then till now, you just remember all the good stuff. That's all survivorship bias. All the crap has fallen away. <laughs> that's a good <laughs> right? point. Like, there was just as much crap then as there was crap in the 90s and the 2000s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so Beyond Thunderdome, this one was written by Terry Hayes, George Miller, and Byron Kennedy. He comes, uh, comes back, right? And this one, yeah, again, has Max. Tina Turner, as you said. Bruce Spence is in there. He's got a kid as well. Uh, <laughs> a little junior. But he he's very minimal in the movie, which is good. <laughs> This one, though, has the classic, what everyone remembers as well, is the Master Blaster, which uh, is Angelo Risotto plays Master, and then Paul Larson plays Blaster, <laughs> which it's a big person being backpack carried with by a little person on his back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a little weird. <laughs> and basically, like, Blaster has a big metal helmet, so you never see his face. And then Master has like, you know, a hat and monocle and stuff like that and directs him. He's like, go over there, do this thing or whatever. <laughs> a hat and a monocle. Yeah. Well, later in the movie, he, he changes into a full kind of like suit and everything looks more proper. But in, in Barter Town, he's just kind of there. So yeah, the, what happens in the beginning of this one is Max is trundling along with his vehicle and it's being towed by camels because I guess he's out of gas. And he gets Not attacked. Really. He gets attacked and his vehicle gets stolen. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, and it's dragged into a town that uh, we learn is the name is Barter Town, and it's being run by Tina Turner, and it has power, which we find out is being provided by uh, manure, pig manure specifically. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, and Master Blaster, well, Master knows how to do this, so they have like kind of a, an uneasy alliance where he provides the power and stuff like that, and she kind of provides the law and runs the town where it's it's all about making deals and stuff like that and being hey no violence here but if there's a if there's a problem we got the thunderdome <laughs> is it like wait 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 mm -hmm. sorry i'm thinking of a i'm thinking of <laughs> an episode of community sure when they when it's the um the floor is lava episode and shirley has the cafeteria set up as her like <laughs> That's totally the same thing. Yeah, all right, I'm on board. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so what, what they do, though, is that they want to hire Max to kill Master Blaster so that Tina Turner can run the town unopposed. But then they want to power. No, but see, she... Sorry, she wants to kill Blaster so that Master still has to run stuff, but because of the combo with Master Blaster, no one can, like, take him out because Blaster's too strong and, like, kills all, all people who try to t come at him, essentially. Wait, and which one's Master and which one's Blaster? Blaster's the big one. He's the muscle. Okay, okay. Yeah, Master's the brains. And the, so the they reason need, is... They need Master to make the power. Yes. They don't need Blaster. Correct. And they okay. want to kind of enslave Master because every time there's kind of a, a butting of heads, Master just turns off the power of the oh. town. And so Tina Turner is like, hey, we just want him to perpetually run the power and we can keep our town going, essentially. 
Like, she's not and a good guy. Problematic? <laughs> yeah, no one's technically a good guy here. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Yeah. So yeah, she hires Max to do it. Max is like, I don't know, maybe I'll think about it. Like, I'll, I'll get, get me down there. I'll get some more information. He finds out that they have his vehicle down there. And he's like, all right, hey, that's my car. I want it back. And they're like, well, it's our car now. And he's like, it's on. They end up in the Thunderdome. <laughs> and they basically, it's literally a dome with weapons. And they get attached with like bungee cords around their hips. And so they can jump up and down and like pick up weapons and attack each other. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Weekend Wasteland has a Thunderdome that's set up exactly like that. I thought the bungee cords were just to make it like fun. <laughs> I didn't realize that was from the movie. Yeah. <laughs> Weekend from... Wasteland is like Burning Man, but Mad Max themed. <laughs> oh, okay. There, that makes perfect sense then. <laughs> yeah, it totally does. <laughs> yeah. So there's an epic showdown, and then um, Max like hits off Blaster's helmet and realizes he's like simple and, you know, mentally not all there. And he's like, I'm not going to kill this guy. That's not even like, that's. This is even more problematic now. <laughs> <laughs> so he doesn't do it, um, but some of Tina Turner's crew does, like shoot them with a crossbow or whatever kind of thing. And then they're like, well, I had a deal with Max and he reneged. So we have to spin this punishment wheel. <laughs> and, <laughs> of course. Yeah, he just has to suffer a random punishment. And the punishment is, and it doesn't kind of make sense when you think about it, that they need resources. They put them on like a donkey or a horse. I think it's a horse. And they just send him out into the desert. And you're like, wouldn't you want to keep the horse? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is where I feel like they didn't know exactly what to do because he, you know, passes out. He gets brought in and then is woken up by a cave of children. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> yeah. they, live, they live in like a canyon slash some caves. And then, like you said, there's there's a little crew of them and they, they basically... They do a retelling of the lore. And this time they do talk about how nukes went off. It wasn't oh, just okay. it was like, you know, they're like, they call it the, the apocalypse or whatever. They were in a plane that crashed and now they've been living in this canyon. And there's wait, like, wait, supposed... wait. nukes went off and it knocked the plane out of the sky. Well, nukes went off somewhere. It doesn't necessarily say like it went off where they were. <laughs> okay. Okay. But it was a plane full of children. No, well, there was, like, other people on there that are presumably have died at this point, because some of the kids are, like, too young. So they probably, like, had them and stuff like that. Okay, okay. Sorry, I'm just That's picturing right. a plane full of, like, it's a one school trip <laughs> yeah. on a plane. Yeah, sidebar, there, there's a remake of that movie, I think it was, what is it, Alive? About that rugby... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's like crash. that, with, with like, a, a, an elementary school team. Yeah. But they landed, in, they landed in somewhere, you know, where they actually have water and, like, food. And Max is, like, because they're all, like, uh, you know, the captain said he would come back one day and you look exactly like him. And you can lead us to, like, the, the like you know, a better place. And he's, like, no, we, we, this is, we should chill here. <laughs> right? Yeah, like, there's is, actually is, water yeah. and food. <laughs> nice. And he's, like, no, if you leave, you're just going to run into Barter Town. And that place sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but some of the kids, they're like, no, the time is nigh, we should leave. And so they do. Like the, you know, there's like a small crew of them that leave, a small crew that stays. And then eventually Max is like, oh, I gotta go after them because they're just gonna get murdered. <laughs> <laughs> and so he goes after them with some some more of the crew of the kids. You know, there's like a, a mute kid that he brings with them and stuff like that. And basically, yeah, those kids that first left, they all almost died and some got captured and so the, you know then the rescue is on he's got to rescue them um they rescue blaster as well because they're like they make a deal with him because he's like well i'm just being enslaved here now because mm. i don't have blaster anymore and so max is like yep let's do it and they it turns out like the master's house is like a train and it's on tracks so they bust out and then that's the final chase sequences they're now on like this train this two-car train and it's on some tracks running through the desert and they get chased by cars and dune buggies and all that stuff. But this one, so it was, this one was as a really cool action, final action sequence, I think, because uh, Mel Gibson slash Max is able to like 
go from different vehicles and like attack different people and stuff like that. Well, that's he's, kind of fun, yeah. Yeah, because he's not driving the car this time. Someone else is, right? Yeah, Which yeah. Again, yeah. continues in Fury Road. Anyway, big action sequence. They get away, but then they're still being chased because they end they hit the end of the track. Conveniently, they get near the gyrocopter pilot guy's house, <laughs> and uh, they force the, him to like fly them out of there. But they're too heavy, and the, the people are attacking. So Max gets into a vehicle and like plays chicken with them because he's like, "I'll drive in front of you, you guys, and the plane behind me, and I'll lead you, and then you can get the the, the takeoff room." And he does. They do. You know, the uh, car crashes. Tina Turner comes out and is like, "Eh." Nobody won this one. I'll see you later. Kind of. <laughs> That's very big over. Yeah, basically, I was kind of like, she would have no reason to not kill him. <laughs> It'd be like, yeah. well, I'm just annoyed. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. And then, yeah, it, it just kind of ends, right? Is this song, We Don't Need Another Hero from that movie? Yes. Nice. Or it was reworked to For be in this, yeah. Because she, she, like, adds some lyrics about, like, Thunderdome and stuff like that. Thunderdome. <laughs> yeah, no, hundred percent. It. <laughs> it's like in Love Actually when he changes the song from like, um, "Love is all around us" to "Christmas is all around us." <laughs> <laughs> just throws thunder, or like yeah. a Jason Derulo song where she's just like Thunderdome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But yeah, what was interesting, of course, is that it it this was nineteen eighty five. And he goes on to do other things. And basically, there was always talk of doing another Mad Max movie. And because, like, again, moderately successful. It's bringing in money, as Hollywood always does. They're like, make a sequel. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so, uh, like I said in the book that I read, that it was, I didn't realize that he had been working on one forever. And at one point, Mel Gibson was signed on to do it. Of course, he was a bigger star. He's, you know, went on to do Lethal Weapons and all that kind of stuff. So the budget had to increase to pay for him. Yeah. And they they had a script that he liked and that George and them kind of liked. They built vehicles and everything for it. They scouted locations. And then, um, essentially, in that instance, when 9-11 happened and the U.S. dollar went down and the Australian dollar went up, it basically cut 30% of the budget oh, and, shit. yeah like the basically the project got pulled and so they had to burn all the vehicles that they had built <laughs> and just like end it why wouldn't they just keep them it's hollywood they do weird stuff <laughs> yeah right, fair enough yeah they they destroyed all those um and so then he moved on to doing other films like but he was working on it and wanted to continue to do it at But basically, while he was working on Happy Feet, he had another part of his production office working on Mad Max. Like, people would be brought in to be like, oh, I'm working on Happy Feet. Okay, cool. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, it's just over here into this room. And then you're actually on the Mad Max project. And they're like, what? (laughs) 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 And so he was had this whole project going parallel to all his other movies, essentially, the whole time. Because they were going to do it again at one point, but then... Um, with Mel Gibson, but then of course he ran into some personal issues and everything like that. So they're like, okay, you can't do it with him. We we got to recast. <laughs> yeah. hey, I'm not trying to get political and say he was a big weirdo. <laughs> He's a big weirdo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, so they, you know, they're like, we got to recast. We got to rethink this whole project. And because again, they were going to do it in Australia, but then they wanted to do it in Namibia. Because they were like, it's all pure, pure desert. And they're, again, the studio was like, no, that's going to be insanely expensive. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they just kept working on it and working on it and working on it in the background while he was working on all these other films. And like I said, they would bring people on and then just kind of shunt them to the Mad Max office <laughs> and <laughs> make them start designing vehicles and build stuff. And they just kind of kept it going until eventually they got the AOK. There was a new... Um, there was a new guy who was taking over at the Warner Brothers like movie production part and they were like kind of showed him they're like yeah this is what we got and they were like do it this sounds sweet um but what was really interesting is that <clears throat> they they didn't have enough money to shoot the beginning and the end they just had the money to shoot all the stuff in Namibia so oh, okay 
So, because he didn't tell them that they were going to Namibia to shoot everything, he basically like loaded all the vehicles onto a boat and then shipped them over there. And they're like, "Okay, we're gonna go shoot it." And they're like, "Why are you not in Australia?" <laughs> 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 and so, on the production, essentially, like every month, like an executive would fly out from Warner Brothers to be like, "What is happening?" And then George Miller would have like a meeting with them, and the guy would just fly away because he'd be like, "Here's what I'm doing. It's gonna be fine." <laughs> and he just kind of kept his vision. But it was also interesting in that um, all of the stuff, again, aside from the beginning and the end, is shot in sequence, which, again, increased the cost because it's like they were destroying all these vehicles and having to rebuild some of them and yeah, yeah, et cetera, yeah. right? So, uh, which I found that to be, again, fascinating that it was all done. Yeah. Famously, of course, I'm sure you've heard this, it didn't have a script. It just had storyboards. Oh, I had heard that. I also heard that, sorry, who... What's the, the main guy in it? So I guess we didn't talk about that. Yeah, it's uh, it's got Tom Hardy as Max, Charlize Theron, of course, as Imperator Fur Furiosa, Nicholas Holt as Nux, Zoe Kravitz as Toast the Knowing, which is kind of interesting. Her name is a amalgamation, small sidebar. Toast was a VFX guy who came on, and he, yeah. whenever he would go to projects, would bring a griddle and make French toast for the crew. And cast. And so he got the nickname Toast. And Zoe Kravitz liked it. And she's like, I want to be Toast. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but sorry, you were saying uh, what were you were going to say there. Oh, I just, I heard that Tom Hardy and <laughs> Shirley Theron just did not get along at all. And that she hated working with him. Yeah. So according to the book, they definitely clashed a lot on set um, in that they just had different working styles. But then it was also like Tom Hardy would be like out partying with the boys and have like an 8 a.m. call and then would show up at like 1030. And Charlize oh, that's would fair. Be, I'd be annoyed by that. too. Yeah, she'd be in the vehicle like ready to go. And they'd be like, do you want to like go somewhere and like sit? And she's like, nope, I'm waiting. I'm on I'm on set. <laughs> you know, I'm on set. I'm on time. I'm here. Yeah. I'm so they got in some clashes there. But then there was a point apparently it was probably later, of course, in it where they did kind of reconcile and almost it was like the same point that the characters reconcile in the movie where oh, they then kind of started yeah. to work well together. <laughs> and I think because it, uh, Tom Hardy admits that he was like, I was a bad scene partner. He's like, I didn't realize what I was should have been doing. And he's like, but as soon as I started to kind of get into that mode, it clicked and started to work a lot better. So I think mm. there was a point where they did start to work well. But yes, for most of the production, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think even though they reconciled, I think she's gone on record as saying she would never work with him again. And that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is too bad because, like, eventually, like, it seems like they're working super well together. <laughs> I really liked her in the movie. Yeah. I didn't like the movie very much, but I thought mm -hmm. she was very cool in it. Yeah, and I guess, like I said, I should back up a bit. Um, it, this one was written by George Miller, Brendan McCarthy, and Nick Lethury. And mm -hmm. it had a budget of $150 million, uh, brought in 380.4 in our dollars. Budget's about 194, and that's about 493 million. So again, decent return, not the greatest, but pretty good. Um, like I said, uh, Hugh, Hugh Case Byrne, he comes back as Immortan Joe in this one, and yeah, it's just got a bigger, much bigger cast, of course, because you got you know. Uh, Rictus and Rosie Huntington Whitley plays uh, the Splendid, who dies at that one point. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, because you've got the crew of ladies. And one thing I found was really cool, there's a woman there, uh, Megan Gale. Um, I don't know if you remember the movie, when they eventually get past the green place and they find that crew of women with, like, the old women and... Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, like, uh, Charlie Theron's people and stuff like that that she was kidnapped from. That woman... Uh, the younger one, like her sister or whatever that they say, uh, she was actually cast. George Miller was going to make a Justice League movie at one point. Oh. She was going to be Wonder Woman. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, super cool. Um, and so while she, so he called her and was like, hey, do you want to come on, on this project? Because he likes to bring in the same type of people if he likes working with you. And she was yeah. like, sure. But she, she, she either had another project on um, about to go or she was pregnant one of the two i can't remember the exact the, the anecdote so she was like i can only be there for a bit and and he was like oh, okay that's kind of too bad and he's like oh i worked it out he's like if you want to come we'll just we'll kill your character though early into like the final chase and she was like sure that's that's cool but then after of course the movie she was just like ah oh, now i can't come back though if they do a sequel <laughs> 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 but she was saying you know 
the 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 production and all the the people like making the vehicles and the car like all the stuff like working with her like she was like oh what about doing something kind of like like almost like raven esque and she was, they were like yeah totally and they come back and like her rifle is all full of like raven motifs and feathers and so was her oh. motorbike and everything like that and she was just like not expecting that kind of thing at all of course that's awesome <laughs> yeah so they really went above and beyond and. Basically, some of my favorite anecdotes from the book were that, like, at one point, the production was literally going to be shut down. Like, the head of Warner Brothers came out to Namibia to, 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 to talk to George and them. And so on that day, production was shut down. But the stunt people and, like, some of the second unit people stole the war rig, went out into the desert to get B-roll of the war rig driving around because they're like, nice. we're going to need this footage. <laughs> and, and they're just like, you know, one of the people are like, if someone asks, you had the day off. He's like, yeah, I was at the pool all day. <laughs> nice, nice. He said, they, yeah, they're driving through locations and like at points they had to like coordinate to, to make sure that the executive on the tour like wouldn't see the vehicle. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yes. So, so a lot of that was going on. And basically what had happened was, is like I said, he was given a deadline where he's like, okay, you got to shoot. This is what, you know, you got to shoot with this left. You got like a month and a month to do it, you know, and that's going to be what you got. And he's like, okay. So they shoot all the, like the big main chase sequence and action scenes and everything like that, that they get. Cause again, this movie, they did as much as they could practical. Of course, there's CG, you know, hiding stuff, wire work, you know, big backgrounds when the big storm, of course. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, as much as they could practically. So they shoot everything. And they wrap up and they're like, okay, everybody go home. But the producer, and basically he knew, he was like, this movie's not going to work without the beginning and the end stuff that we need to shoot. And they had built those sets in Australia. Okay. And so he basically was like, at some, at, at one point, he basically was paying to like, keep that stuff not destroyed. Because he's like, they had to destroy some sets, but he's like, we're going to need some of this. So yeah, he was yeah. basically just paying for it out of pocket. They, they, yeah, they edit the movie and, you know, the uh, head of Warner Brothers is like, hey, this is great, but this doesn't, you know, connect. There's nothing here. And he's like, yeah, we didn't get to shoot these pages or whatever. And he's just like, yeah, no, go shoot that. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so they had to come and they had to get people back, of course, then to shoot yeah. this stuff. <laughs> uh, like, basically, it's like the stuff at the beginning um, with like the water and like the Morton Joe and the stuff at the end with his corpse and them going up and so, and so they had to get everybody back to like shoot some of this stuff <laughs> but yeah nice. and then they, they shoot the movie it comes out it's pretty successful um i just thought that it was very interesting a lot of the behind the scenes of the the fact that he was trying to make this movie essentially since the 90s <laughs> i have a question about the, maybe that's answered in the book sure i really hated the guitar player strapped to the mm. I thought that was so stupid it looked ridiculous I didn't understand the point of it and yeah. everybody else seems to be really into it but I was wondering do they explain why that's even in there yeah they do I, I'll probably misquote uh exactly why but it was basically the idea was is that for a moving army like this like in our world, in the past especially, they always had drummers and fifers and players and stuff like that. And he's like, yeah, but like have drum, drumming makes sense because you can march to a drum beat. Yeah, they had drums in this as well. Yeah, but a guy doing a sick riff on his fire-breathing <laughs> guitar, you can't march to that. No, it's just more for, I think, again, intimidation effect and troop hype. But what's interesting about that is the, that's the guitar player, uh, what is it, Iota was his name, is that they built the guitar and it was just a prop. And uh, the like the main guy was like, oh, that's really sick. It, you know, like it blew fire and everything. He's like, oh, that's great. He's like, I can't wait to hear it play. And the production guy was like, wait, it's supposed to play? <laughs> and so he had to basically rebuild it and oh. actually make it playable. So it is a real playable guitar that can shoot fire and everything. And so Iota, when he was on the set, he was like, it's so heavy. That's why they had to put it on bungees. But it's actually playable. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I, I think, still think it's dumb. No, but it, again, it this is heightens the Mad Max post-apocalyptic craziness that these people are in. You know, like the, they're worshiping engines and stuff like that. So a, a I, rock I thing. I thought it was supposed to be like kind of fantastical. Yeah. 
but I, I don't there was just like so many choices like that in the movie that just I was just like why you know your party needs a bard you gotta hype people up <laughs> No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's also kind of funny, too. Like, obviously, we, we can hear the music because of the sound mix and stuff like that, but there would be no way. Yeah, no one like, would hear that. You know, in a desert. Hear. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> there's just, just all the engines going, right? And just. <laughs> I also thought, like, like, I get it. You're supposed to show that they're in a cult and it's really silly. Mm-hmm. But the whole chrome mouth thing was just yeah. stupid to me. Like, I like Nicholas Holt in it, because yeah. I, I like him in everything, basically. Even in Renfield, which was bad. Yeah. But the whole, like, yeah, the, what did they yell? It's like... Witness me. Witness me, right. Yeah. Because yeah. they thought but... they were going to Valhalla, you know? That was, like, the final charge for victory. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> No, and well, one thing that's kind of interesting, and, and again, this is like, it's all subtext really with this movie because it's all, but it's like, you know, one of the reasons that they would worship engines and stuff like that is because their bodies are riddled with cancer. They're all failing and falling apart, whereas the engines don't, right? Oh. And so it's like, like you said, there's that mechanical purity, whereas they're they're not, they're falling apart, <laughs> right? I guess. No, but you're right. There's a lot of, there's, yeah, I'm not saying everybody has to like the movie. I love it. It's a masterpiece in my opinion. <laughs> like, I know that I'm in the minority by yeah. not enjoying it. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes it's okay to not like things that other people sure. like. Yeah, and... It won Oscars, didn't it? Well, sorry? It won an Oscar or two or three or something, right? Uh, I want to say it won something like art direction or production and stuff like that. Like maybe some technical stuff, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So it was yeah. a tech, like a technical masterpiece. I just yeah, didn't and, enjoy the story or dialogue or <laughs> or some of the weird choices they made. It was well, I, it was a visual splendor though. Yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons it was um, is because they had he had that time and he just had like all the storyboards, so every shot was actually thought about beforehand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A well, we'll just shoot it green screen in the volume. We'll just make up whatever. It's like no, no, no. <laughs> We're driving these giant vehicles in the desert. <laughs> like they have to do it right. Like all the again, like the the people coming in on the Cirque du Soleil bands. It's like that's all done. Like for real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like you know they can't just whatever it. Um, but one of the reasons I kind of wanted to do this was is in the book he does talk about it and that there was the idea about doing the Furiosa movie, which. They talked about doing in like 2016 um <clears throat> and I, th- I thought the movie wasn't gonna happen mm. but there was a trailer released and taylor joy of course is playing furiosa and uh chris hemsworth is in there as a Morton joe i believe and it was kind of interesting because they did ask or the, the author asked uh, charlize about it and she was like i want to i'll do it she's like I, I would do a prequel i would do a sequel she's like i want to play this character this character rock yeah, yeah. And she was kind of like, oh, I'm kind of sad if they do a prequel and don't ask. But she's like, power, you know, good luck to the next actress kind of a thing, right? Which Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I want to see it because I like Anna Taylor-Joy, even though I know that I probably won't enjoy it based on Fury Road. <laughs> well, it's interesting because there is a comic, uh, which I have read, I own it, and it is a prequel. Um, it's a story, It's it focuses on Morton Joe and his, like, building of the tower he lives in and the gas town and the bullet farm and all that kind of stuff like that. Like, so that crew, so I don't know if they're going to follow that story or not. And because again, Furios is in it as well, because I don't know if you know, excuse me, her backstory is that she was held as a bride, but is infertile. Oh, she couldn't have children. So she was cast aside and then worked her way up to being Imperator. That's one of the reasons she has the hatred for Joe. (laughs) That's fair. He's also just a gross asshole. Sure. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Right. So, but yeah, I, like I said, I was kind of surprised that at the announcement and I'm excited to see it. Uh, Yeah. I honestly didn't think it was happening, but again, it's like that same story between Thunderdome and, and Fury Road where it was just like parallel producing it in the background, but no one knows. <laughs> and then it's like, nice, nice. oh yeah, we're doing this Mad Max. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the craziest one. Like, oh, sorry. I was going to ask, did you like Tom Hardy as a replacement for Mel Gibson? So, yeah, I 
like I've always lo- I've liked the Mad Max franchise and all that, but I've never been like Matt, uh, Mel Gibson Stan in that way. That yeah, I yeah. I loved him as as Max. I would have I want to see him in a sequel as well. Because <laughs> he doesn't really say anything the whole movie. <laughs> no, but that's that's the same as the first three Mad Maxes as well. He doesn't say oh, anything true. really in those movies <laughs> either, <laughs> aside from like I'm here for the gas. Oh, let's make this deal. Okay. <laughs> and then they're just driving for 30 minutes. So <laughs> there was so if I'm unless I'm mistaken, doesn't the movie sort of open with like flashbacks for Max? Yeah, so the, what they did was is they kind of um added those scenes to kind of give him more of an emotional like hey, he screwed up in the past protecting people. And mm. so maybe he's trying to make up for it or he's haunted by it or yeah he's haunted by it <laughs> and were those was that footage that they show from like previous movies or did they reshoot stuff i think they shot everything there because i i feel like in the second one road warrior they definitely show some footage from the first one from mad max mm-hmm. one and i think in the underdome the same thing they show like the moment where uh like his wife gets run over and stuff like that that's shown like she's not run over in the shot it's just like a car driving and then you see like a a shoe you know kind of thing but like that moment gets played over a couple times (laughs) yeah it's artsy it's not gory yeah yeah but yeah i I think in in this one i I remember it looking terrible and (laughs) stupid they did that stupid like shaky cam they did that weird um like frame rate that peter jackson always tries to use and he uses excessively in King Kong. Yeah. He also uses it in Lord of... It's the only part of Lord of the Rings that I don't like, because I think there's some orc footage where he has, like, a slower frame rate, and it just looks really stupid and ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fair enough. Uh, I, like, you know, I think, like I said, it was something that they realized that there was, like, they need to add an, an element to flesh out Max in some way and to show something about his character yeah, yeah. versus because like you said he doesn't say anything really he's wearing a mask for much of the beginning of the middle movie <laughs> and he kind of just yells his about his car mask on. Yeah, and he yells <laughs> about his car because they're using it <laughs> right, so. but yeah you're right not a lot of dialogue in the beginning <laughs> I remember he, he tells her what his name is at one point near the end yeah that's after they're friends that's right. That's how they become friends. Yeah. Like, my name's Max. Yeah. And then he doesn't say anything for the rest of the room. <laughs> and then Nicholas Holt is jumping around in the background and being like, witness me. <laughs> I like ladies now. <laughs> I didn't like them before, but now I saw a boob. <laughs> I think they're cool. <laughs> I think it was more they don't get access to that kind of thing because he's a, a war pup or a war boy, I guess, at that point. Oh, okay, yeah. Because the Morton Joe controls all that. <laughs> That's true. He's like, I saw a boop for the first time, guys. I know what we should worship now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that there's this these people that are like men, but curvier and softer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and again, like you said, it's all like that cult behavior and everything like that, so. Yeah, yeah, I know. I I understand it. I just don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> I had a friend say that I it was supposed to be like an exaggeration of toxic masculinity, and that like it's supposed to be kind of stupid. But mm-hmm. I I feel like like my I'm just tired because I feel like whenever films try to like show that exaggerated toxic masculinity in a way that like lets you know it's being toxic that a lot of people end up just liking that right <laughs> instead of under like like you know you get it with people who worship rick from rick and morty yeah or patrick like, bateman the, the joker patrick bateman like all that yeah. stuff right like yeah meteor literacy you know there's some some Education lacking, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I I go on YouTube shorts way too often, which is like TikTok for millennials, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and 
every once in a while I come across somebody like critiquing a movie where I'm just like, you don't do like, how did we watch the same thing and you right. missed the point so completely? Yeah, like something like that could be interesting if it's like, oh, just like a different take or what have you. But like you said, if you're just like, no, 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 that's not even in the movie at all. <laughs> like this is way beyond death of the author here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, well, yeah, or, or they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to have this ridiculous guitar player to show like how, how, I don't know, whatever. And then people are like, no, that's just a rad guitar player. <laughs> and it's like, no, is it? no, <laughs> stop it. I mean, like what you like, I get that too, whatever, but at the same time, just like, <sighs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like like you said, in this in this movie, like, Joe is the bad guy, like, his methods are bad, and, you know, it's, et cetera, so it's, it's, it's more binary in this film compared to, like, other films. Like I said, in Beyond Thunderdome, essentially no one's the good guy, even Max is, like, completely selfish and out for himself. Yeah, yeah, that's right? a good point. Same in the second one as well, right? So that's pretty consistent. But in the third one, it's more kind of explicit where it's just kind of like, he's just wandering around doing stuff. This one, there's more of like, he gets wrapped up in the situation and then, you know, helps the good guys, <laughs> yeah, the good yeah. people as we would see them in this situation, right? So, uh, but you're right where it's just kind of like, yeah, no, those guys, are, that's the bad guy. <laughs> Yeah, like, and I don't know, again, because they're doing, they, you know, if there was talk again of, of sequels and stuff like that, it's, I don't know, it's always hard. And especially because right now, Warner Brothers in particular, they've been going through all sorts of weird stuff, like with their CEO, he's been trying to cut stuff, and then they're, they're going to try to merge with another company now, and etc. Their comic book stuff hasn't been as successful this year. Uh, you know, it's who knows now <laughs> if these companies. I'm sure Disney will own them by the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but they had a rough year too. Like, you know, t I think the top five money losing movies of the of 2023 were Disney movies. Oh, really? Yeah, like they lost they lost some change. You know, obviously they have a lot of resources and stuff like that. But oh, I guess what was Marvels was one of them. Dial of Destiny. Assume. Which one? Dial of Destiny, Indiana Jones. Oh, did they lose money on that? Oh, they lost a lot of money on that. Oh, uh, yeah, that makes sense, because it wasn't very good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like Wish as well, they've lost money. Yeah, like Oh, said. yeah, yeah. So I saw an interesting video on Wish, side note, because a lot of people are saying that it looks, it sounds like it was written by AI, and it looks like it was animated by AI. It's people's big complaint about it. But apparently, like, this animator I was watching was explaining that because they wanted it to have a fairy tale feel, they wanted it to look, even though it's like a CG, like animation, yeah. computer animation, they wanted it to feel like a fairy tale. So they wanted it to look more like old Disney animated movies like Snow White and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they took out motion blur and apparently taking to, to like emulate that style, but taking yeah. out the motion blur makes it look like cheap made for TV animation. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, again, I'm no like animating genius, but if you want to make it look like the old style, just do it just in the old animate. style. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just, just, just animate it. <laughs> like well, it was probably just... harder to do what they did versus animating it. <laughs> maybe there's just not the same pool of skilled animators at doing 2D animation at that time particular studio and they didn't want to hire outside help or whatever sure i mean i understand that but like you said if it's like gonna make it look janky yeah apparently it did <laughs> i didn't i didn't even know it was out until i heard people complain about it i saw a trailer for it when i saw the marvels and, yeah, I, saw I, was a trailer for it and I was like oh i didn't even know they had this movie coming out <laughs> <laughs> and like you said it then it was out like the week later or whatever i was like whoa this movie's coming out <laughs> no it was Oh, no, wait. When I saw the Marvels, it was already out. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. What do you uh, do? No, yeah. But like I said, I just wanted to talk about the, the franchise of Mad Max. I do recommend watching all of them. Um, no. They are interesting, not to you, to other people. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're interesting because they're all, like, from some different eras of filmmaking. Um, but, like, I think if you're going to ask, like, if you're going to want to go with, like, a ranking or anything, 
Fury Road, the best, Road Warrior, number two, of course, and then you got Thunderdome, and I think the first one are kind of, I, I think the first one is more, is like interesting, but it's not as entertaining as Thunderdome. <laughs> I remember it being very boring. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, like I said, but there's some cool there's some cool action in the beginning and at the end, but in mm. the middle there is uh, they got that seventies pacing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. Um, should I wrap up then? Sure. Unless I guess you have any other questions. I know you asked a couple, but I don't. But I think this was a fun episode. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I I like talking about it. Excellent. What's the book called again? <clears throat> Sorry, the book was Blood, Sweat, and Chrome, The Wild and True Story of Mad Max Fury Road by Kyle Buchanan. Awesome. Would you recommend the book as well? Yeah, it was very fascinating. It was different than I was expecting, like, because I had read uh, Future Noir, which is about Blade Runner, and mm. that was written by a guy who was, like, on set, and, um, like, they're both clearly, like, Hollywood reporter writers, but this one was like whereas Future Noir has some interviews with people, uh, and there's like other writings about he. This book is all interviews. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, and it, but it's woven into like when he's talking about like oh here's like the production when they're building the cars, so he's interviewing all the people who build the cars, and it's just like their their thoughts and etc. And like you know maybe something from Charlize where she's like oh I saw the war rig and it was like super badass or you know that kind of a thing. So it's all interviews. Oh, was, that's really, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, it was far different than I was expecting. There's, like, you know, some commentary here and there, but 99% it's interviews. Cool. Yeah. So thank you so much for listening. If you would like to hear more of us, our podcast is available on all podcasting platforms. You can also check out our YouTube channel, which is Tome of Uselessness where you can both see and hear us. Um, <laughs> we're also on Instagram, where I post when Dan sends me clips. And that's also Tome of Uselessness. You can email us, tomeoflesslessness at gmail.com if you have any questions, concerns, comments, or suggestions. And then we also have a very awesome website, which is tomeoflesslessness.com. And uh, that's it. Yeah, stay safe and thanks for listening. Yeah, bye.